Jane Bradley and Arizona moving on, heading to Los Angeles, and uh, they'll face the winner of Clemson Baylor in the Sweet 16. Let's recap as we start with Gonzaga and Kansas. Uh, that was uh, quite the second half from Gonzaga. I mean, they overwhelmed the Jayhawks in the second half. What did you see, Matt? I saw a program that was standing on pride and making a ninth consecutive Sweet 16, which is tied for the third longest streak ever. Uh, it's just it's phenomenal, and there's a reason why Mark Few did bring that up in the postgame, because he's so proud of what this group has done but also what the program represents. And this was an up and down season for Gonzaga. It did not have a tournament resume on February 1, but it went on a huge run down the stretch, was able to get to the five line because BYU had to be dropped to, uh, dropped to the six because of uh, its Mormonism and not playing on Sunday. It doesn't matter. They, they were able to take advantage here and now outperform their seed expectation. Yet again, you're a five seed. That means per your expectation, you're supposed to lose to the four in the second round. Nuh uh nope. Graham E.K. has come on huge. Ryan Nemar's been big, even Ben Gregg and Anton Watson, who cut down his figure a little bit this season, is a really, really good defender. There's enough pieces here. No, I don't consider Gonzaga to be a national championship contender. No one really has. But to get here every single time for nine years, there's only one other program in the tournament right now that has an active multi-year Sweet 16 streak, and it's Houston, which is a one seed, and it's at four. It'll be at five if the Cougars can get it done on Sunday. So all too impressive, and they... Uh, yeah, they might have something to say in the second week. And you never take Gonzaga for granted. They are always dangerous no matter where you see them and no matter the scenes, the seed lines, the rounds, all of it. And Chip, how about Ryan Nemhart? He had five points. He had 12 assists. I mean, he was orchestrating this offense all afternoon. 100%. And one of the things that there is is just such an immense trust with Mark Few and Nembhard and the ability to understand how to set up his teammates because this was a performance for Gonzaga, especially when you got into the second half. I mean, they just had the Jayhawks on their heels. If you were betting on Kansas to run out of gas, I think you're validated. Now, you weren't validated in that they were not able to beat Samford, but you're playing in Salt Lake City at altitude. You've got a short bench. I kind of do feel like Kansas poured it out with a little bit of motivation, understanding everybody was doubting them coming into the week. And so I thought that after halftime, yes, it was Gonzaga's excellent execution, but some of it, especially once that deficit got 10, 12, it kind of felt like the Jayhawks. They knew it was midnight. Without a doubt. And you also got to give credit to the Gonzaga staff. They were running a ton of great actions, and they had they had. Kansas on ice skates. There's just no question about it. It was a offensive clinic and yes, Gonzaga was able to additionally be able to turn this on. In fact, in that run overall for Gonzaga, they went so 26 16 for Gonzaga of real game clock. They went without missing consecutive field goal attempts. So everything hit at the right point. I agree with Chip. It, it was a situation though where Kansas probably ran out of gas. It didn't have the depth in altitude, two games, three days. A Gonzaga team that is all too ready and eager, Chip and Akeem, to be able to get rolling and keep it moving. Really impressive stuff. And now it's, I would argue for Gonzaga, it was house money coming into today, period. Right. I mean, it is, it is totally house money, no matter if they're going to wind up facing off against Purdue or Utah State in the Sweet 16. Upgrade Gonzaga. Whatever your, like, pre-tournament rating was, upgrade. Great weekend for the Zags. Yeah, because they went from being questioned to get into the tournament, and now they're in back into the Sweet 16 mm. for the ninth uh, consecutive year. This is a, a Kansas team that had so many high hopes coming in preseason favorite to cut down the nets. What's next for that program? Well, on that note, by the way, the, the drought continues and the drought is entirely reasonable here. We have not had a team since 0809 Carolina enter the season number one in the AP top 25 and then go on to win the national championship. It's a really hard thing to do. It's out of Kansas to control that. I mean, they had all these issues here. Uh, McCullough's going to go pro. He's, he's his future. That's that's pretty much over for sure. Dickinson uh, Dickinson has an opportunity to continue to cash in on name, image and likeness and earn, if not north of a million, very, very close to it overall. Offensively, he's obviously a key player player here. Kansas will be diving into the portal unquestionably, but it also is about the development here because I do expect Johnny Furphy to go into the NBA draft. I think he's probably, probably played himself into a first round selection, but we'll see. His process will actually be pretty intriguing there. And then Marco Jackson, who came in as a Highly touted and someone I saw play in person at the prep level. I love so much of what El Marco Jackson was doing before he got to Kansas. Now he needs to go into the lab for the next seven months and emerge as a 
a prominent, important, key factor guy that can run that Kansas offense. But rest assured, this is Kansas. Self is still there. They are going to have, I would bank on it, two of the 20 to 25 most important transfer portal ads whenever yeah. that gets to it. So they'll be in the mix and going into, into next season. It would surprise me if Kansas isn't rated as a top 10 team going into November.